and welcome back to the MMA India show. It has been a, a, a crazy night and day. Uh, we uh, interviewed uh, and uh, welcome Akhilesh. Me and Akhilesh both uh, interviewed uh, Uriah Faber uh, in the night at 2.30 a.m. And uh, I think Akhilesh continued watching uh, Glory Collision. <laughs> I went to sleep and I woke up again at 7.30 to watch the... I saw some of the prelim matches and uh, uh, then, of course, the main card. So, it's one of those Sundays where, of course, at least me, I know you, uh, 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 your body doesn't care whether it gets sleep or not. I think uh, you're, you're like, uh, you know, your body's like that Al Pacino movie, Insomniac. I don't know how you uh, get by without any sleep. But anyway, the... The, the main card was suspect till it happened, I think. It turned out to be a really amazing card. And it's one of those Sundays where personally, at least me, I'm just soaking in, you know, the, the fights that were seen. The high quality uh, skill that we saw from the fighters. And all I can say is my cup does not have coffee today. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, what do you yeah. say, Akhilesh? I mean, uh, an amazing main card. Yes, I, I think everyone anticipated a good card. The only reason I think people kind of looked down on, on 206 was because A, it was supposed to be GSP's grand return in Canada. That didn't happen. And then it was supposed to be Daniel Cormier and Anthony Johnson throwing down once again after Johnson's impressive uh, couple of string of victories. Yeah. And that didn't happen. So then, you know, with UFC having the iconic 205, UFC 205 in Madison Square Garden and you know, Ronda Rousey returning uh, yeah, at UFC 207. It's, it seems sandwiched between two really superb cards. Yeah, and people started you know, talking about how there was no proper attention given, given to 206. No one ever said that you know, it wasn't going to be a good card. Everyone thought it was uh, a, you know, a, a card which was not promoted properly. Yeah. Uh, but you know, going into the night... Uh, just the prelims itself, uh, you know, you had some really, really good fights. Uh, even the last one, uh, Mercier. And even before that, you know, you had uh, uh, some, even Valerie, for example. I, I saw was, a, a, a Venata versus Magdesi. And I thought it was a brilliant, yes. brilliant fight. Of course, it ended in the first round itself. Venata, is, yeah. it showed such good skill again. And he's so loose and he's so cool. I mean, uh, his nickname, Groovy, uh, isn't there for nothing. And that spinning kick was just, you know, on the button and with such ease. I mean, of course, it's easier said than done because, uh, you know, when you're in that ring, there's so much pressure. But, but to be so ease of movement with your skill, under that pressure is what's amazing. Yes. So, as I said, it wasn't just that, you know, you had the Scoggins fight, you had uh, uh, Misha Serkunov, you know, had a tremendous, tremendous victory. Uh, we also had, as I said, Oban Mercier, who was fighting in his hometown with, with an impressive victory. Yeah. So I think the prelims card itself was stacked, uh, and the fact that you know you had a couple of really good fights built up the night. Um, you know, but as we got into the uh, you know deep deeper end of the night and into the main card, I, I don't think anyone was expecting this kind of an outcome. Although yeah. you know, just just to ask you a question, I was only able to see up to the second round of the uh, Valerie fight. Pereira, uh, Valerie Pereira fight, uh, and then something uh, happened with my internet. Uh, of course, she was on top for m most of the time. Uh, Pereira seemed to have uh, cage jitters. Uh, what happened with the fight finally? Of course, Valerie won. No, so uh, Pereira won. Uh, oh, so what, what happened say? was, so this is this is the problem with uh, athletes who cut a lot of weight. For example, yeah. if you have someone like Valerie Lotono yeah. who cuts down considerably to come down to one fifteen. Even if UFC had 125, you know, they had a couple of flyweight fights. If, even if they had, you know, that kind of a division, it, it opens up different avenues for the fighters who don't have to cut so much weight to come down to 115. Yeah. What happens to fighters like Valerie is, once they go through the first round, the fact that they put on so much weight, they cut so much weight, and in one day, one and a half days, they put on yeah, that yeah. amount of weight once again, they tend to gas out really, really soon. You know, yeah. once you go into the second round, they start gassing out. And as I said, you know, we, we remember while talking about uh, Pettis and Holloway, I said I want to, want to see how Pettis does in the second round. You know, then I can judge if yeah. uh, he's good to go for five rounds, how he's going to do for the rest of the rest of the fight. So, similar thing with Valerie. The fact that she got so much weight 
showed in the second round when she started gassing out and that's when you know Pereira took control of the fight and in the end eventually although I thought uh, Valerie took the fight uh, you know going to the judges they saw it differently so what happened eventually it was a decision win for Valerie yes. or sorry Pereira for Pereira yes okay okay fair enough uh, I will get back and watch the third round of that fight uh, now, starting with the main card, Jordan Mine versus Emil Meek. It was very unfortunate. I mean, the first round was was pretty good, and we saw a, a lot of all round skill from both uh, fighters. I, I forgot if it was the first round itself where Emil Meek uh, held the side of his, uh, you know, rib cage, and uh, one that thought that either that was the first round, right? Second round. That was the second round. Okay. Well, the first round, of course, was much much more competitive as well. Afterwards, where you know Jordan Mine showed some great all-round skills, you know he 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 seemed uh, to be you know on the back, so to speak, uh, after almost two years out, and uh, but he seemed just you know for lack of a better word, not to give a fuck. You know, <laughs> once he was on his back, you know it, it's like he was uh, just very comfortable, uh, rather than trying to. You know, be aggressive and win the fight. He he just didn't seem to want it hard enough. Right. Uh, so when you have someone like Meek who was making his UFC debut, of course, I was taking nothing away from Meek. Yes. You know, but yeah. Yes, I wanted personally wanted to see how Meek would do because he was coming off of, after you know an impressive, impressive victory against someone like uh, Rosemar Palharis at Venator. Uh, Rosemar is a former UFC uh, you know uh, uh, competitor, so. And one of the most dangerous uh, fighters out there, you know, his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is amazing. And the fact that he's, his, his nickname is Tokinho, you know, he's, he's short and stout, built like, uh, you know, a, a, a body, you know, a legit bodybuilder. Uh, so the fact that he knocked him out in 45 seconds in Venator, he was coming off, you know, uh, with, with a certain hype. So I wanted to see how Meek would do. But again, you know, saying that mine was returning after nearly two years since his uh, last fight in the UFC. Um, the fact that Meek, uh, you know, so, you know, you look at someone like Meek who had so much weight and he was constantly, as you said, in the second and third round, pushing his weight on top of uh, mine. The fact that mine was not able to do, and this is what I thought, he did not do enough. He had no offense. His defensive guard wasn't that great either. Uh, but the fact that you no, know, he 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 did not explode. He did not try to get out of the out of that predicament where he was constantly on his back, and he was you know happy lying down. He, he didn't do enough, uh, you know, to to turn the predicament or you know to get on top or probably you know take take the fight back to the to the feet and exchange. So it was it was you know one of those fights where you you think one of them did not do enough, so the other won the fight. But take nothing away from me, you know, he looked absolutely phenomenal. Uh, there was one instance where, you know, they were both on the ground and I think uh, mine was going for an amba. Uh, this is in the third round. He was going for an amba and Meek just stood up and he carried him. Yeah. You know, he carried him. He rallied the fans. Phenomenal showing by Meek. Yeah. Not good enough by mine. Yeah. Not good at all, I, I would say. You know, of course, he came out, like we said, uh, in the first round, seeming like he wanted to fight, but he just faded away after that. Now, coming to uh, Tim Kennedy versus... Uh, uh, Kelvin Gastelum, I have to say, I was really underwhelmed by Tim Kennedy's performance. He seemed to, as soon as he got hurt the first time, just seemed to be cautious a little and seemed to be like, he wasn't expecting to be hit, almost. You know, like, what the fuck was that? And Kelvin was, you know, very fluid and he seemed, of course, uh, aggressive all the time, which in the post-fight conference also he said... You know that people still haven't realized that he he he's uh, he tries to be the aggressive most of the time. I was really uh, disappointed with uh, uh, Tim Kennedy, and of course there was talk about him carrying too much muscle and it, uh, you know, stopping. Uh, you know, it 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 it. it uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is. It uh, uh, he, he it, it made him gas out maybe a little easier though. I I don't know if that's the correct frame. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Kelvin seemed the much more. I mean, he he never seemed in any trouble. He never seemed uh, uh, to be breathless. Uh, he was always in control, and he his boxing was much better than I thought. Of course, we all know him as a really good grappler, 
but his boxing was on point. He he's he was always hitting the mark more, more or less. Whereas Tim Kenny, when he was trying to survive, I think after the first round, and just trying to get out of the way most of the time. Yes, so I know we even talked about this in the preview where I said his you know the, the main difference would be uh, Gaslam's boxing, the, the fact that he's a very crisp boxer, he's is very on point. Um, you know, talking about Kennedy, uh, I don't. Uh, okay, so muscle is one factor, but the other factor that everyone has to consider is the fact that you know he's coming uh, back to fighting after a long time. You know, yeah. uh, ring rust is obviously a legitimate thing; it's not something yeah. that is made up. So that is one factor that played a major part in uh, Kennedy's fight as well. I'm um, saying that you know he looked pretty good in the first round. You know, he had Gaslam's back; he was making Gaslam carry his weight. Uh, but you know the other thing that I need to say about Gaslam is, I think 185 size-wise is you know not Gaslam's division, but the, just the, the fact that he was carrying uh, you know Tim Kennedy for all of the first round, but still he was so impressive in reversing the predicament. You know he he was so he, having he switched you know, it very quickly a couple of times. Yes, yeah, so t- those those transitions, the, the way he reversed those predicaments, uh, especially in the second and you know when when uh, Kennedy started gassing out. Mm. He looked phenomenal, you know, although, as I said, you know, 185 is might not be his division because it's pretty small uh, for that. But uh, he reversed the, those predicaments. Then he started uh, wrestling with Kennedy. He started grappling with him. He started exchanging uh, on the feet, trading on the feet and, you know, showed exemplary uh, uh, boxing uh, technique. You know, the way in which he gets in those tabs, creates those angles, gets in the range. And then all the Kennedy had the you know uh, range advantage. Kim, um, Gaslam managed to connect and then move back. So his crisp boxing uh, was the difference. But at the same time, Kennedy was not the same Kennedy that you know you saw a couple you, you, of years ago. Yes, because he's been out for so long. Yeah. Coming back, ring rust is a very definite uh, reason for every fighter. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, and uh, Kelvin did say in the post-fight uh, uh, conference, that he does want to go back to uh, 170 definitely and uh, because he feels that's his natural weight because the guys in 185 are much too big taller and reach wise for him so he feels 170 is the right you know and he he did admit to having a bad lifestyle outside of camp and so most of his camp was uh, taken up by trying to you know make the weight so he has said he's going to make better lifestyle choices to be closer to the weight getting into camp, which I think is very uh, important for him to make weight. So all the best. And he seemed very confident going into the fight and rightly so, you know, beating a very, uh, what we thought would be a strong uh, Tim Kennedy. But unfortunately, if we want to call it ring rust, getting the better of him and just uh, a, a better fighter as well on, yeah, that, on the day, you know, on the day. Right, I, I you know talking about Gaslam going back to 170. I do not know if any fighter at 170 would be willing to fight Gaslam anymore because, uh, you know, we both know that you know once a fighter accepts and uh, Gaslam fails to make weight, yeah. it's only half of the show bonus or, or the show money that the yeah. opponent will get. Yeah. So it's it's a very tricky proposition. And the other thing is you have the likes of Damian Myers who's who are sitting on the sidelines. Uh, so Gaslam needs to go through at least a couple of guys yeah. to even talk about being in a title contender fight. Yeah. I think he would, uh, uh, you're right, you know, no fighter would want to go through a whole camp and then have to uh, face a guy who misses weight. Uh, right. So. Now, coming to what a lot of people touted would be the main event of the night, which was Du Hoi uh, Choi versus Cub Swanson. Now, right. what a fight that turned out to be. You know, it's very hard to sit and describe and analyze it as well because there's so much back and forth. No fighter could take it easy for even a second. The minute one was trying to press forward, you know, before you even knew it, you didn't see and the other landed left or something in, in this melee of an exchange and and the other guy was on the back foot then. But that was brilliant. I mean, so many times we thought one of them would go down and they didn't, especially Duhu Choi had a chin of iron. You know, one has to <laughs> hand it to both of them that, you know, we thought so many times, at least I did, that the fight was going to end. You know? Right. Um, uh- so this is where I said, uh, you know, I, I sided with uh, Cup Swanson because of his heart. You know, even when we talked before, I said I, I, I would never bet against Cup Swanson. And this is exactly why. Uh, you know, you, you have a sequence in the second round where both of them were just throwing barbs. Yeah. And uh, Swanson connected with some uh, really good combinations, 
which uh, you know kind of uh, shuffled uh, Choi and he returned the favor. You know, it was going back and forth. Ala, you know, you had that uh, exchange between Travis Brown and Andre Arlowski some time ago, where uh, you know one rocked the other, then the other rock, the other person rocked the other yeah. one. It it went yeah, back and forth. That. So it was something like that, and it was it, it was you know as a fight fan, if you're sitting and watching something like that, now that is in an out of the body experience for you. Yeah, and you know especially the contrasting styles. Cub Swanson was so, you know, he almost reminded me of like a well, uh, it's it, it's not the right uh, uh, comparison because Cub Swanson is much ahead of him and, and been fighting like this for some time. Is Vanata. You know, that very cool, laid back, trying different stuff. And even a Tony Ferguson, the same kind of, you know, very laid back, trying different things uh, kind of style. Whereas uh, Choi was very, you know, uh, technical, proper, waiting for the right moment and, and just going in there. Whereas Swanson was trying these different kicks, hitting from anywhere. You know, he was just very uh, loose. You know, of course, so was Choi, but come in a different sense altogether. Yeah, so you know, in the beginning of the fight, you had this this feeling that uh, Choi was gonna just sit back, uh, absorb whatever Cup Swanson was throwing at him, and counter him, and which which was working in the first round. But just the fact that Cup Swanson kept throwing those barbs time and again, and not giving Choi the opportunity to counter properly, and then Choi, you know, has a, as a, as you said, an absolutely amazing chin. Yeah. He absorbed all of that punishment. Kept coming back, and there was this one instance where uh, Cup connected even with a wheelbarrow kick. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then Choi, yeah. he did not even do anything for him. And you know, you 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 got the sense that Choi was not going to go down ever. They were just standing and trading. Um, as you know, you, you had the second and the third round, which was which was completely amazing. You know, it, it was. Uh, many said it was a fight of the year candidate. I till now at least see it as the fight yeah. fight of the year. In fact, I, I think. think Choi should be the one who's called the Korean zombie because no matter how much <laughs> you hate him, he kept coming forward, like coming back from the dead each and every time. So, yes, you know, so I definitely, I, yeah. Yeah, and when you look at someone like Choi, you know, you wouldn't think uh, going into the fight, if you look at him, you know, he looks like that K pop model who yeah. uh, is a teen sensation rather than a fighter. Yeah. But when, when he gets inside that cage, you know, an absolutely amazing fighter. Uh, yeah, as you said, words might not do justice. Even you know, after a couple of hours, I'm still, yeah. uh, you know, trying hard to express what that fight was like. But still, you know, it's it's hard to do that. And both of them were so quick on their feet, you know, and very quick with their their hands. And they were just so. I think they were both desperate to win, and that's what made a really amazing fight. They just would not uh, give up at any 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 time. Yes, and this fight meant a lot to Cup Swanson because, uh, as I said, you know, previously he was defeated by Max Holloway and Frank Edgar, two of the yeah. most elite fighters in that division. So he was kind of building a winning streak once again. Yeah. And Choi was seen as a very, very difficult opponent for him just because of the amount of punishment he could absorb and the amount of, uh, you know, his technicality in countering uh, his opponent. Uh, you saw that, you know, a lot of people actually picked Choi over uh, Cup Swanson. So it was really an important fight for Cub. He needed to win this fight, uh, you know, to go anywhere in that division. Yeah. Well, coming now to uh, the co-main event, uh, Donald Cowboy Cerrone versus Matt the Immortal Brown. Um, like, of course, a fight between two veterans. Matt Brown did try to really build up, you know, the anger and the, uh, you know, the uh, angst between both of them and it was working I think to a certain extent to create a lot more interest in the fight. Matt I think seemed very desperate to win you know and and he 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 he, he did he was doing much better than I thought he would be doing those first two uh, uh, rounds. Uh, he was getting some uh, good hits in he was I think the only time, uh, well, well, the only time Donald really seemed in some uh, serious bother, of course, was when he got the arm triangle. We thought it might just be one of those, you know, uh, things where he got lucky with. Right. Uh, so one thing we need to understand about Brown is just because, you know, he lost a couple of fights, people kind of have underestimated Matt Brown. But, yeah. you know, he's, he's a really, really dangerous striker. You know, you, you remember the bloodbaths he had previously. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing that, you know, many people 
kind of take it for granted that brown is a really good grappler when he's on the back you know is you have fighters who have good offensive guard you have fighters who are very good defensive guard uh, and and you have especially you know when when you have elite fighters who train in brazilian jiu jitsu their their game when they're on the backs it's very impressive it's very different to say you know your your standardized wrestlers or grapplers yeah and uh, that is because they can throw submission out of any any you know uh, from anywhere yeah so mad mad was in a predicament where he was on his back but immediately you know as you said caught seroni uh, almost in a triangle and then if i remember correctly tried to convert it into a, an amba but seroni managed to wiggle himself free uh, from that predicament so it was it was a fight where you know seroni wanted to ideally put you know keep the keep the fight standing because he knew uh, due to his his range uh, longer reach uh, that he he would have the advantage standing up um again you know we talked about how seroni has a very underrated jiu jitsu game as well so it was a very interesting clash of styles uh, but you know as as we saw seroni wanted to keep the fight standing uh, landed some really really slick combinations uh where you know brown had to come within the boxing range to do anything while sorony could stand on the outside and uh, you know do, inflict some punishment so in the end you saw sorony tagging brown with uh, some really really good combinations yeah. and ending things with that uh, head kick yeah though so he did uh, seem in trouble once when uh, again i forgot if it was a right or a left and he did seem dazed and he went down for a little bit but of course Sorry, he really yes. yeah so he immediately got up but he did seem like he was in trouble for a bit yeah and knocking sorony down is not yeah knocking sorony down is not something that you see in every sorony fight yeah you know so yeah as as i said uh, brown just because he lost a few fights people have started underestimating him people started started for, forgetting how uh, dangerous yeah, Matt brown really yeah. is well again the way uh, sorony finished the fight was pretty impressive he just went down you know that uh, connected straight on and uh, he went down and there was no getting up i think sorony knew it as soon as he connected and he was just uh, walking off yes yeah, so the impressive thing about sorony is he, he, it's it's how easy he makes uh, things seem you know he connected with that switch kick which came out of nowhere you know just as brown changed levels you know he he changed levels probably was trying to go for a takedown or something but sorony telegraphed it and automatically connected with a switch kick uh, and he just walked as if nothing happened yeah so now sorry in the post match conference he has said you know he wants a, a, a fight quickly maybe ufc denver and he's open to even hore masvidal who uh, of course called him out so uh, and who told us as well the same thing when we interviewed him that uh, uh, he wanted to fight uh, cowboy sorony and he's open to that so that may just happen now i think it's a good possibility because uh you know both fighters were supposed to fight before yeah uh there were a couple of shuffles uh, masvidal fought someone else uh, and it, although you know it, it was controversial it still picked up he still looked good against selberg you know so uh, and and seroni looked really good against matt brown yeah so this fight was supposed to happen earlier this year but you know both are interested in fighting in denver yeah probably going to happen well yeah we look uh, forward to that fight i think it will be a really amazing fight if that actually happens Now coming to the main event Max Holloway versus Anthony Pettis. Of course it became a, a in, interim title fight and then changed to only a, a, a an interim belt for Max Holloway if he won and not for Anthony Pettis because he missed weight. You know, as uh, we were just uh, speaking about you mentioned uh, uh, you know that in the preview show that we did that him making weight is not that easy anymore. It's not an easy weight cut for him. and uh, you were right he missed it by 3 pounds uh so he wasn't going to even if he won he wasn't going to get the belt the interim interim title belt but uh, uh max holloway again showed why he's on a nine win uh, nine uh, fight winning streak amazing distance control always seemed just out of range and you know even when he's backing up he has the skill to immediately come back in and counter uh you know uh, as and when he wants so uh, it, it's always like the other guy is always kind of searching for him and not able to you know uh, find the distance perez of course i think in the, at the end of the very first round did seem like he broke his hand i don't know if he actually did or not but uh, uh, he seemed to be shaking it and that's what he told his corner yes uh, so the impressive thing with holloway is uh, you know 
you, you going into the fight, you have seen that Pettis was much bigger than Holloway. Yeah. Uh, so and you know Pettis again a dangerous striker. Holloway realized that he he circled uh, Pettis all through the first round, and as you said, you know started coming in, landing his combinations immediately went out the pockets. Uh, what Pettis was trying to do was you know he was trying to establish a range uh, so that he, he can he can probably work from the outside rather than allow Max to get into boxing range and. Uh, box with my box with Holloway because Pettis is known for his dangerous kicks, his body kicks, the way he can you know manipulate uh, the distance and uh, uh, you know land his his combinations. Max did not allow uh, Pettis to do that. You know his constant circling uh, kind of threw uh, Pettis off his game, and uh, Max was able to you know get into the boxing range, get into the pocket straight with uh, Pettis, out, you know immediately get out of the pockets. But while exiting, you know the the, the you know uh, the implicit thing with Holloway's game is his exit and entry points, where his you know he entered into the pockets immediately, tra- trade combinations, had you know pull, get it, got in his jabs, and he pull out. And yeah. well, yeah, it, while going out, he still landed some, some good yeah. shots. Yes, yeah, so getting out of the pockets. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that Holloway kind of uh, went into the fight with the game plan that he went into the fight with was not to go to the ground with Pettis. You've seen a couple of times where Pettis went to the ground and Holloway and Holloway said stand, stand up. Stand up. Yeah, that was twice. I think he did that. Yes, yeah, so in Holloway, fact, the second he, time, I think one of the commentators even said that he would not give up such a position, and immediately did. Yeah, so Goldberg said uh, Pettis would not uh, uh, give up such a Pettis so, or uh, Holloway. I because Pettis was on his back. Was, it, yeah, I don't think if if it was for this fight, maybe it was. No, it uh, maybe was, I'm mistaken. Yeah, it was. So if, if okay, so if it was for this fight, then it was uh, Holloway. Hmm. Uh, so he did not want to go to the ground with Pettis because he knows Pettis uh, has a really good jiu-jitsu game, yeah. as, as you know we've seen. So whatever wins Pettis has got, I think a good amount of that came in submissions. I think seven or nine uh, victories of his came to submissions, and uh, his submission against Oliveira, uh, supposedly one of the better jiu-jitsu practitioners in in the division, yeah. uh, you know, kind of showed uh, that Pettis is no muck when he goes to the ground. So Holloway had to. Uh, stay away from that predicament. So he was happy standing on the feet. He was happy trading shots with uh, Pettis. And the other thing was Pettis has a really good chin. He he has never been stopped in his entire career. Whatever losses he had yeah. was for you know through decisions. He was never stopped. Yeah. So many thought this would either go the entire five rounds or Pettis would uh, you know likely pick up the victory. I think so. Pettis that just was, gave up at the end. Yeah, I mean, his chin finally had to give up. Yeah. You know, when when you uh, get into that uh, uh, tussle with, uh, he, he, with he almost seemed best. relieved when it ended. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Max Holloway is one of the dangerous strikers in the division. Relieved, uh, but because I, I think, think he he had done some damage to his hand. He wasn't able to fight the way he wanted to, you know. Uh, so so yeah, that way, I mean, so he, he he wasn't giving you know much resistance with the fight. Ended like I said. I think it, it almost looked like he wanted it to end by that time. Um, he also showed the redness on his torso, you know, because of the body shots he received uh, from Holloway. Oh, yeah. um, I think a large part has to do with the weight cut as well. Um, just the fact that Pettis, he looked aggressive. He looked, he pushed the pace. He did something that he hadn't done in the past four fights. Uh, that was to, you know. Come out aggressively, push the pace of the fight, get in, uh, get in his uh, you know opponent's face, and then trade. He did not do that. He did not. He tried doing that with Dos Anjos, did not work. Eddie Alvarez did not work. Uh, Barboza, he looked a shell of his his former self because he lost two decisive fights uh, against Oliveira. I know he did not look that convincing, but against Oliveira, I thought Pettis looked more confident. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the th- end of the uh, nearly at the, at the end of the third round. Holloway was again. He established a range, and he was he so so efficient in getting into the pockets and then in getting out and yeah. creating that separation. Um, and then he, you know, landed his combinations. I think Pettis, uh, his chin gave out finally, and then the fight had to be stopped. Yeah, of course. And he has, of course, called out Holloway. Uh, I mean, uh, Aldo. Uh, right. You know, uh, to the point of almost disrespecting the champion. Of course, that's one of the ways they get. The other guy riled up and uh, wanting to fight. Of course, the mental warfare has begun, so to speak. I think that would be a great matchup, Jose Aldo versus uh, Max Holloway. Yeah, so Jose Aldo is a different beast. Yeah. Um, you know the way he sets things up with his leg kicks, vicious leg kicks. Uh, you know the, the the fact that he's one of the most efficient boxers in the division as well. 
Uh, I think, you know, Max Holloway, I said it before, he deserved to fight for the title long ago. Just the fact that, you know, his loss, after his loss with Conor McGregor, he kind of had uh, to take a couple of pointless fights, which did not do anything for his for his career. Yeah. Then he built on that nine-fight win streak coming into this fight. So I thought that, you know, the title fight was long overdue. Uh, but at the same time, you had Conor McGregor, who was the champion, who did not fight for an entire year in the division. So I thought, you know, uh, with all these culmination, culminating into a situation where Holloway just did not get his due. You know, he did not get his title fight, which he was supposed to get. So... You know, it's going to be interesting. Uh, a fight between Jose Aldo and uh, Max Holloway. That is going to be one of the, you know, more prominent fights in the featherweight division in in the in recent memory. I think. Yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be. Uh, uh, he's going to be one of the toughest opponents Jose Aldo is going to face. Yes, definitely. I mean, I mean, with all due respect to the guys that Jose Aldo uh, has of course, with the all past. due respect to Frankie Edgar, Chad Mendes. You know, all these guys, but uh, I think he's, uh, you know, a, a, a tough guy. Of course, he uh, enjoys, I think, a height and reach advantage uh, over some of these other guys. Yes, so uh, Holloway would present a very different challenge, a very unique challenge um, to, to Jose Aldo. But at the same time, you know, Holloway would be kind of aware of uh, the, the strong points of Jose Aldo, the, the things that he managed to avoid against Pettis. He might not be able to do that. And by that, I mean the ground game. Uh, he might not be able to do that against Jose Aldo. So, it's it's going to be a very interesting fight. Uh, if And when that happens, it's going to be, I think, one of the more prominent fights in, in the featherweight division. Yeah, well, having said that, uh, we have our winners. So, for the USI Universal Gloves, the, the contest, the UFC 206 contest we had, the winners are uh, Emil Meek. Kelvin Gastelum, Cub Swanson, Donald Cerrone, and Max Holloway. And I know you want the gloves, but you already <laughs> said you already said it's a clash of interest. So you said it, <laughs> not me. So sorry. Gloves aren't coming your way. So let's see. You know, we're gonna check our uh, you know uh, all the entries and see uh, who's won. If anybody, hopefully, you know, some people have won because we want to give these you know amazing gloves uh, away. And we are sure some people uh, would have gotten the right, uh, you know, uh, predictions. Otherwise, you and me are going to have to take up boxing very soon. <laughs> I, I hope that happens. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I also wanted to, you know, uh, just just ask the fans to go and check uh, Glory 36. The Glory Collision card happened earlier in the night because that presented a couple of amazing fights as well. Uh, yeah. So, so that was pay per view though. That so on uh, UFC Fight Pass also you had to pay for it separately, right? It's on UFC Fight Pass. I mean, if you're paying for UFC Fight Pass, it's on UFC Fight Pass. No, I think even on UFC Fight Pass you had to pay for it separately. No, no, no. So UFC Fight Pass income encompasses all these in, in uh, different all. promotions. You didn't have to pay for it separately. Okay. Anyway, at three o'clock in the uh, night <laughs> or three thirty or four, whatever it was, I was just and having to wake up at seven thirty again. I was just not in the position. <laughs> to uh, watch it, but I will go and watch it now, you know, and uh, so we can talk about it later, maybe because I was I, okay, just tell me who won. I still don't know who won. <laughs> so uh, the top three fights were Tiffany, a time bomb, who is the new uh, super bantamweight champion. Uh, then you had an amazing fight between uh, Nikki Holskin and Dumbe. Uh, Hol- Holskin, you know, one of the best welterweights. Who won? He lost his belt. Oh, he, he lost, lost his belt. belt. Okay. Yeah, and the main fight, you know, which was hyped as the fight of the century. You know, you had uh, Rico, you had Bajahari, who was and coming Bajahari, back. Yeah. Uh, Bajahari looked phenomenal in the first first round. But unfortunately, there was a, a situation where both were tied up in a clinch. Yeah. And uh, Rico delivered some nasty knees, which kind of dislocated uh, Bajahari's shoulder. Oh. It, it was either his shoulder or his elbow. Uh, then the fight had to be stopped. So it was a TKO victory for Rico. Okay. But both want to fight again in 2017, which I think is going to be one of the biggest kickboxing uh, matches of all time. Yeah, well, uh, great. We will see at that time. And, and there was a small... Uh, we said uh, UFC Albany was going to be on UFC Fight Pass, but it was actually on Sony ESPN. So, you know, uh, thanks for Sony to Sony ESPN for showing both these fight cards live on their... Uh, channel i thought because on ufc fight pass it was reflecting as only showing on ufc fight pass right so that's why we said it's going to come on ufc fight pass but it, it did come live 
on UFC, uh, uh, the on Sony ESPN, of course. Unfortunately for these guys, nobody's talking about it because of <laughs> UFC 206. Not our fault. The card, you know, UFC 206 card was so brilliant. So, having and said that... And, you know, if, yeah. if, if we have to talk about Albany, there's just one guy that we need to talk about, Engano. I think the main event even was lackluster. But, you know, in the heavyweight division, uh, you have Engano. Yeah, was, he, he beat uh, Anthony Hamilton. Yes, phenomenal. Okay. You know, scary, scary dude. Okay, so we look forward to his next fight. Till then, we are signing off. Praveen Dabas and Akhilesh Ganavarapu. We will search for the USI Universal winner. And we will <laughs> enjoy the rest of our Sunday while the technical team works on editing and uploading this video. Work hard, guys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. By the time you see this, it will be Sunday night. So enjoy your Sunday night. Cheers. Good night.